All right, if you have a Bible, I want you to go to Leviticus 20. We're teaching tonight on breaking the power of enchantment. And breaking the power of enchantment. Leviticus 20 and verse number 6. 20 and verse 6. I'm reading from the King James Bible. Share on YouTube and Facebook if you could, please. It said, And the soul that turneth after, such as have familiar spirits, after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will set my face against that soul and cut him off from amongst the people. So under the Levitical law, the Lord was saying, if you went after those with familiar spirits, if you went after those of incantations, if you went after those that practiced any kind of spirituality that was not referencing Yahweh, uh, then you would be cut off. God was warning his people, you are not to get involved with these things. The word enchant means to bewitch. It's important that we understand that the power of witchcraft comes to bewitch us. And we are living in a world in which witchcraft is fused into our everyday lives. Many times we get saved and we begin to come to a Holy Spirit filled ministry and we are facing things in our lives and we don't understand uh, why we're facing these things. Sometimes we're facing heaviness we're facing bondages we're facing family issues and no matter how hard we pray we can't seem to break away but oftentimes there's been a doorway that's been open and I want to talk tonight about the doorway of enchantment it's interesting that the Bible says familiar spirit that word familiar is a, is a, Greek, a Hebrew word OBE it means uh, it is associated with the terminology necromancer one who invokes the dead. It means uh, it's associated with the word ghost or spirit of a dead one. And so there are two manifestations of familiar spirits I would like to point out that Leviticus 20 is dealing with. It is dealing with the association with the dead. We need to understand that the book of Hebrews says it's appointed a man wants to die and after that the judgment. When your grandmother Gertrude dies, she doesn't come floating back into your living room. Now, you may have a dream. Let me clarify. You may have a dream about grandma. There's a difference in having a dream about somebody or there's a difference in you going into heaven. We know that uh, according to the writings of John the Revelator and many other writings in the Bible, we know it's possible for our bodies, our spirits rather, to come out of our bodies and to ascend into heavenly realms and heavenly places. And so if God took you up into heaven and you saw your grandmother Gertrude, we would know that that's biblically a possibility but if you go to uh, some person and, and you say I'm missing my grandmother and they say well the spirit of your grandmother is here now and she's saying you love red shoes and you begin to cry and say oh my goodness how in the world do they know that because what familiar spirits do is they're imitating spirits and so familiar spirits will come to try to convince you that you are interacting with the dead when in fact it's a demon Someone say it's a demon. It's a demon. And so there are Christians that believe in the practice of talking to the dead. It can be a very dangerous practice. I understand sometimes we go through trauma. We go through crisis. We miss people. We go through issues. But there is a, a doorway that opens in the dimension of the spirit when we get obsessive with death culture. I think one of the things the enemy does is the enemy will try. Can we just bump the house lights up a little bit, please? The enemy will try to bring an obsession with death culture. We see people uh, doing goth things and we see people uh, painting their faces white and putting on black lipstick and we see people wanting to wear skull uh, shirts and have skull tattoos and have all kind of skull things on and, and we've got to be cautious of that because oftentimes we are entertaining a false spirit. We are entertaining a familiar spirit. Another uh, manifestation I believe of a familiar spirit not so much associated with this one here but one that I've seen in and out of Christian circles is, is false spiritual manifestations. Now, I grew up uh, Catholic, and thank you so much. I just feel like preaching on demons. I don't want to be in the dark, you know. I appreciate it during the worship, but I need light. I need to see your face and I feel like we're not in, a, in some rock concert somewhere. So... Uh, I think that one of the things we've got to be aware of is that spirits will bring manifestations. 
You remember the Bible said Satan would attempt to deceive the very elect. And the Bible tells us how Satan comes with deception. Satan comes appearing as an angel of light. Growing up as, as a Catholic in the Catholic church, one of the things that was, would happen frequently is what they called stigmata. And stigmata would be a situation where uh, somewhere in the world a statue of Mary would start crying. And people from all over the world, Sam, people with sick children, people with ailments, people with problems, they would travel and they would go to that statue and they would say, God is surely doing something. But see, the Bible tells us that we are not to get into idolatry. Sometimes people want to have a, a picture of Jesus in the house. And I love art, so let me just classify that. I love art, but I don't like spooky things that people talk to in worship. So if you want to have a picture of an artist rendering of Jesus, and you just think, oh, I think about Jesus, and I said, fine. But you're going, getting in front of that, talking to Jesus, that Jesus is not in that painting. But see, spirits will do things in the natural realm to en bring enchantment or seduction. There are two things often associated with high-level witchcraft practices. One of the things associated with high-level witchcraft practices is power without consecration. Witches seek power. I remember dealing with a witch who had been sold to Satan as a child, came from a family of witches. I will not describe to you the things that I was told. There were a couple of people in my ministry career that I've dealt with that were some of the hardest I've ever dealt with. This was one. Uh, there, there was a young man, 17 years old, that needed to have, uh, I'm looking, I'll just say the PG version, physical relations with something. Let me say it that way. Something, anything seven to eight times a day to be satisfied. That was one of the hardest demons I dealt with. Another one of the hardest demons I dealt with was a convicted child molester. And they would counsel with me and say, I want to be free from this. I don't want to have this. Why was that so hard? Because I wanted to, I wanted to run the person over with the car. I didn't want to pray for them. I didn't want to do deliverance. I didn't want to help them. But God will put you in unusual situations at times to help people. And when you give your life to Jesus, you belong to the Lord. And so uh, the, the Satan can come as a familiar spirit. And I remember dealing with that with the woman sold into witchcraft. And she was telling me how powerful the spirits were. And she was warning me about how to minister to her. Because, see, she had accessed certain levels or realms of power. And this is why the Bible said we are to know the spirit. We are to test the spirit. We are not just to believe that every word is a word from from the Lord. We are not to believe that every spiritual thing is from the Lord. Many times Christians get hungry for God and they, they begin to say, well, if a certain thing doesn't happen. One of the issues I've dealt with through the years, a lot of charismatic people. So I use these terms. If you don't know what they mean, I'll explain them to you. Uh, Pentecostal people means people who shout, pray loud, pray hard, run, worship. Spirit build, speak in tongues, obviously. That's the main thing. But the reason we don't call them charismatic is because we're distinguishing they're louder, they're more militant, they do praise breaks. That's Pentecost. Charismatics are people who speak in tongues but flowy, flowy, flowy. Charismatics like to laugh. They like to cry. They like to shake. They like to tremble. Pentecostal like to shake too, but they violently shake. Charismatics, sweet shake. So I've seen charismatic people get filled with the Holy Ghost have an experience where they laughed or they got drunk in the spirit. And then every time, if Pastor Henry's making announcements, they're trying to laugh. Ecclesiastes declares to everything there's a time and there is a purpose. There's a time to laugh, but there's a time to cry. The Holy Ghost is like a diamond. He's multifaceted. One of the things some of you uh, need to be aware of, if you have a low-level understanding of the realm of the Spirit, you will think the Holy Ghost is not present because you don't feel something. The Holy Ghost is not a feeling. He's a spiritual reality. And when we teach the Word and don't have any goosebumps, the Holy Ghost is there. When we do a graduation, hand out certificates, the Holy Ghost is there. When 
when we teach in the children's classroom, the Holy Ghost is there. When we usher, the Holy Ghost is there. But we can get into a rut with God where we try to make God move in a certain way every single time. And what can happen to us is we begin to entertain familiar spirits. Familiar spirits. And so the Bible says we're to beware of that. Spirits that imitate people that have died. Spirits that imitate the Holy Spirit. Spirits that imitate prophecy. Spirit that, spirits that imitate the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, these are what the devil wants to bring to the lives of Christians. We need to recognize the anointing is tied to purpose. When Samuel the prophet went to anoint David, he was not anointing David to fall out. I believe in falling out. One of the things I've seen people, and I, this may ruffle your feathers if you're hardcore deliverance, I've seen people get on this kick because some non-spirit-filled people started to teach that if you shake, it's a kundalini spirit because there's these kundalini yoga people in India. I understand that. I understand that's not good. But they begin to teach anybody that shakes that. The origin of that teaching came from non-spirit-filled folk. And then spirit-filled folk get it and start criticizing other spirit-filled folk. Well, she's shaking. She got kundalini spirit because I never saw but if you study Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 in the upper room they thought they were drunk so this tells us that something was happening in the realm of the supernatural they were stumbling they were staggering they were speaking in unknown languages and known languages but languages they didn't know in the natural but were speaking by way of the spirit tongues is a sign of the unbeliever and Peter said these are not drunk as you suppose he didn't say they weren't drunk he just said they're not drunk as you suppose seeing it is but the third hour of the day but this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith God. People are waiting on the last days outpouring. It began in Acts chapter 2. We're still living in it now. The Holy Ghost is, listen, he didn't run out of Holy Spirit. There's enough Holy Spirit for every nation. There's enough Holy Spirit for every generation. There's enough Holy Spirit for every person. There's enough Holy Spirit for every church. There's enough Holy Spirit for every personality. There's enough Holy Spirit for every family. All we've got to do is open up and say, Holy Ghost, we want you. But Samuel came to anoint with a purpose. The anointing has a purpose. One of the ways to try to attempt to discern is this a familiar spirit or the anointing? Is does this move of God contain purpose? If you're just shaking all the time, but you're a shake and bake. You had demons before you shook. You had demons while you shook. You still got demons after you shook. It's probably not the Holy Ghost. Some people think it's the Holy Ghost. Well, I didn't feel no anointing. I didn't fall out. That's because your measurement stick is low. You only know how to feel what is familiar to you. But God said, I've got more levels. I've got more realms. I've got more moves. In Acts 2, they had never seen a thing like that before. There are some moves of God we've never seen before that are coming to the earth. But familiar spirits come to seduce us. The move of God should bring another level of consecration. When God moves upon you, you fall out, you get a prophetic word. If that move doesn't bring you to a deeper level of surrender, something was missing. It may not be the anointing. Maybe it was the anointing, but you didn't know how to receive it. You didn't know how to yield to it. Or maybe it was a fleshly expression. Maybe you just got stirred and got excited and you just ran and you just jumped and you just shouted and thought you felt something and praise God for that. Or maybe if it's something drawing you away, it could be a familiar spirit. And I want to be very cautious because I, I believe there are some moves of God and things when we're contending, just like we called earlier in the evening, people that would worship come the altar. There are some moves of God that, you know, we, we invoke those moves by faith. We invoke it by our prayer. We invoke it by our praise. So I'm not saying you need to be so analytical that you're trying to figure out. No, you have a spirit that is born again that looks like God and walks like God. 
And your spirit is going to check or grieve if it doesn't align with what God, what is happening at any given time. But the move of God should bring a greater level of consecration. Oftentimes, what happens is people crave power without consecration. I said earlier, there are two things that I've seen associated with high levels of witchcraft typically. One is the desire of power without consecration. There are witches that can move chairs without humanly touching them. There are witches that can levitate. There are witches that can astro project and, and go out of their bodies and travel in the spirit. So these are powerful things that will bring demonstration, but they're not of God. They entered in through a gateway that is false or familiar. Familiar, imitative in nature. And so uh, that's one thing. The other thing that is very common in witchcraft is rampant perversion. Typically because the root of witchcraft is self-exaltation. You're exalting your own mind and your own body without any kind of consecration. So we're living in a world dominated by enchantment. If you say my children are not going to watch that movie because it's teaching them to do chants. Now someone's going to say you're just too much. You're extra. Why you got to be like that? Because I'm trying to keep my children free. Someone says, you know, go to this concert and the, their hit song is this spiritual anthem and blah, 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 blah. And you say, I'm, I can't do that. Maybe you can do it and it doesn't bother you. But maybe if this person's coming out of something or has come out of something, they've got a conviction that's differently than yours. And people say, well, that's just too much. We're living in a world that says you should do what you want to do. You should be what you want to be. We're living in a world that says if you've got a standard, uh, then you're wrong. That you are bigoted. That you are awful. We're living in a world that is crazy, that no longer observes any kind of order. We don't observe order in homes. We don't observe, observe order in government. We don't observe order in our own biological realities. But we're living in a world that has gone mad because it said we're going to serve ourselves first. If you want it, get it. If you feel it, do it. And if anybody denies you, then they are a mean-spirited, nasty person. Yet the Bible declares for Christians there's a narrow road. We can't do everything everybody else does. And what happens is when we do everything everybody else does, we are dealing with stuff. And then we come to the altar and say, I don't understand why this is going on. I don't understand why I'm being tormented. I don't understand. Because you keep going to the psychic. Because you keep on opening up the door for the devil. You can have a thousand deliverance sessions. But one of the greatest deliverances is when your mouth says no. I'm not going anymore to that no. I'm not listening that anymore no I can't go over there anymore no I can't be a part of that anymore no you've got to say no one of the strongest deliverance words in the world is the word no believers are not to get involved in certain things Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 through 14 Deuteronomy 18 Verses 9 through 14. When thou art coming to the land which the Lord gives you, God was dealing with Israel. He's giving them instruction. Why? Because they're coming into lands where people worship trees. They're coming into lands where people have golden calves. He said, when you come to a land the Lord gives you, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Let me be clear. Any practice not exalting Yahweh that is spiritual is an abomination. There's not four ways to heaven. There's not five ways to heaven. We cannot be Christians and be universalists. Well, I just think, you know, those people, we're all searching, searching for the same thing but going down different roads. No, the Bible said he's the one true living God. I cannot be a Christian and agree with that. I can love you. I can eat with you. I can praise for you. I can pray for you. But I cannot agree with that thinking. Why? Because that would make me in contradiction to my faith. My faith says there's only one God. Why am I sacrificing? because I believe there's only one God. Why am I coming to church? I mean, if I don't believe there's only one God, we need to close the ATL hub, hub, uh, hub up and just go be wild. Uh, but we're coming to church because we believe there's only one God. And he's not dead. He's not in a grave. He's alive. Amen. His name is Jesus Christ. And we want to tell the world about him. So God was telling Israel, and we are spiritual Israel. 
He's saying when you go into these lands, don't learn the about. Well, but you know, my family did. My family did all kinds of things. My family did drugs. My family fornicated. My family worshiped Mary. But when I got saved, I got born into another bloodline. I got born by the blood of Jesus. I'm not permitted to do what my family did. Well, but this is my family's practice. Well, you need to get delivered from it. If it's dealing with familiar spirits, if it's dealing with necromancy, if it's dealing with ungodly things that don't exalt Jesus, you need to cut it off. I don't care what, who gets mad at you. When thou art come into the land that God gives you, don't learn after the abominations of nations. Watch this now. There shall not be found any among you that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or uses divination. An observer of the times, an enchanter, a witch, a charmer, a consulter with familiar spirits, that's the dead people, a wizard, a necromancer. All these things are an abomination of the law. Because of these abominations, the Lord doth drive them out before you. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord your God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of the times. Observers of the times. Well, I got to find out my zodiac sign. No, 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 no. Observer of the times. I got to see what is, what's the prediction for my life today. Observer of the times. Uh-uh, uh-uh. This is what the Bible says. Now what Ryan says, what the Bible said. These nations thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of the times, unto diviners. For the, as the, uh, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered or allowed you to do so. So some of the things we get involved in that causes problems, tarot cards. I mean, you could go down, you know, I don't know all the different ways people read your fortune. Palm reading. Uh, I, I know someone wanted me to go have Turkish coffee. I said, as long as I don't dump the grounds and try to tell me my fortune, I'm okay with that. Which I've been in things where people do that. I just laugh and just tell them that's not my word of the Lord. It's all right. I don't get worked up about it, but I'm not going to be a part of it. Tarot cards, fortune telling, astrology, zodiac signs, psychics. One of the big challenges of our age is the, uh, the uh, infiltration of new age thoughts. I remember a Christian lady telling me about auras. Well, you have this kind of aura. I don't have no aura. I have the Holy Ghost. I don't have no aura. But I see light around you. It's the light of God, baby. That's what it is. I don't want to hear about some kind of light, some kind of this, some kind of that. It's the light of God or maybe an angel, but it ain't no aura. It, and don't use that kind of language with me. You talk about people's vibes. You know, their, their vibe just off. And I, let me say, I understand there's an innocent way to use that word because that's an English word. But there are people that use that in a new age way. And so now we just wake up. Well, I just, it's just had a bad vibe today. Well, you need to take authority. You need to tell that devil no. You need to tell the devil, I'm not going to yield to this. I'm feeling it, but I'm not going to yield to it. One popular thing now is manifesting. I don't want to manifest nothing but the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, if you just believe it. You can manifest it. Well, that, that, that sounds good because it's half true. See, and deception's always half true. It's half true, but it's not manifesting in the sense that the New Agers use it. It's called faith. God called those things to be not as though they were. Jesus said, speak unto the mountain and it shall move. That's faith. So what the New Age call, people call manifesting, the church calls faith. But I'm not manifesting in the way you think through good energy and good vibes. I'm commanding. I'm demanding. I'm prophesying. I'm praying. I'm believing. I'm contending. I'm not good vibing and good energy and good thinking my way into the thing. I'm moving at the speed of the Holy Ghost. It's so close to the truth, but only half. Only half. Now people uh, want to wear healing crystals. Well, you know, I got this crystal, and I don't have time for that. 
The devil's a liar. But there's energy in that rock. Well, scientifically, maybe you detect that. I'm not going to argue with you. I know that sound waves are stored up in material and in matter. So I understand this scientific, this thing. But you won't find me when I'm sick rubbing on no rock. You'll find me at the rock called Jesus Christ. You'll find me thanking God for my healing. You'll find me praising God that over 2,000 years ago, he went to a bloody cross on a hill called Calvary. I don't need no stone. I got Jesus. I don't need to manifest. I got Jesus. I don't need it all. I got Jesus. I don't need good vibes. I got Jesus. Someone shout, I got Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People want to talk to the universe. Well, the universe brought my husband. No, he didn't, baby. That's why he got marital problems. Well, the universe just allowed, willed this into being. No, it didn't, baby. Listen, the universe is made of matter, but we serve the God of the universe. His name is Yahweh. His name is Jesus. The Bible says he's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning. He is the end. The Bible said he's the one that was. He's the one that is and the one that is to come. I don't get healed by the universe. I don't get blessed by the universe. I don't get help from the universe. Stars live in the galaxies, but Jesus is Lord over them all. It's his power. It's his word. It's his blood. It's his dominion that is keeping this planet in balance. And I don't worship the universe. I don't pray to the universe. I pray to Yahweh. But if you don't watch your spirit, You'll start talking like those people. Well, you know, I guess just a, I'm getting a divorce, and I guess just the universe didn't want me to be married. The devil is a liar. See, somewhere under all that language, there's a devil loose. In your money, there's a devil loose. In your mind, there's a devil loose. In your family, there's a devil loose. They asked one old preacher, well, I just feel like you're looking for a devil behind every bush. He said, I'm not looking for a devil behind every bush, but when I see one, I'm going to cast it out in the name of Jesus. We have been given power and authority over devils. In the early church, when people got saved, they started to destroy every object associated with these practices. This tells me that one of their steps to deliverance was a destruction of the connection. A destruction of the connection. Sometimes you got to delete phone numbers and push the block button. Well, you know, I, I dated this guy for eight months and, you know, we slept together all the time and I'm just keeping his number because I feel God wants me to pray for him. You ain't his intercessor. No, 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 no. God will send somebody else to be his intercessor. But see, the devil is keeping a connection open so that he can bring you back into bondage. You remember Paul said to the church at Rome, I long to see you that I might impart unto you a spiritual gift. Do you know that witches impart? They like to touch you. They like to impart to you. They understand the principles of legality. Demons understand the principles of legality. If you are born again and filled with the Holy Ghost and know your rights in Christ Jesus, you have power over the devil. And you can tell the devil no. No. But oftentimes, we don't realize how powerful we are. So Satan looks for opportunity in. Sometimes keeping that phone number is the devil's way of keeping a doorway open in your life. I remember getting a phone call. The woman had adopted a small child. She was giving the child a bath one day when the child spoke in a man's voice and started cursing her little child so I said I want to come to your home and pray so I got there 
Now, when you take on a demon like that, you got to pray in the Holy Ghost because you don't know always straightforward what it is. So I got in the home and began to pray. And I said, I want to walk through your home, every room. I don't want you, you know, tell me not going here. Not, I need to just go through. And I got there, and I started to find all kind of different little kids' toys and different little things that had spiritual meanings. And so I started gathering them up. I had a little, you know, character here and a blanket here and a, some, some videos here. And by the time I was done, I had a pile of stuff. I said, all this stuff right here has to go. The mother said to me, that's $450 worth of stuff. I said, what is the price of your deliverance? You're bathing your child and is talking to you in a man's voice through the power of demonic entities. But that's 400. Then the child starts crying. See, one of the problems with families is most families let their children dominate their family. I was... My first church I was pastoring had a woman come, all kind of problems in her life, and she had like a five-year-old child, and, and so she come to the church and, and, and started getting help and started getting free, but the, the, her sister went to a non-spirit-filled church, and she come to meet with me one day and said, my little, I don't remember the kid's name, little Johnny wants to go play with his cousin at the other church. They have a playground, the cousin wants to play. I said, so you're going to let your little five-year-old drag your whole family over somewhere that doesn't teach you the full gospel so they can play on the playground. You could set up a play a date once a week and go on a play date. But parents will let their little children drive them. Well, I just don't know what to do. My children don't behave. The Bible said, spare the rod and spoil the child. I don't understand this modern parenting of negotiation. Negotiate. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't, wanna, I don't care what you want to do. My hand doesn't want to come across your backside, but it's going to come across your backside if you keep talking like that. But I see it all the time. I was in a line in Holland, and one little boy had an older brother and popped his brother. I said, loudly, I said, I wish the brother would punch that kid in the nose and make them bleed. The mother looked back at me, and I said, I don't care. The devil is a liar. She's trying to coddle the child that punched the older brother and, and tell the older brother, don't you hit your, your, this child. I remember after church one time. Now, if you all have kids, I won't do this to your kids, but this is years ago. <laughs> Someone had a little toddler, and the little toddler was darting in and out of a conversation, punching a young lady. And I said, Amy, next time she comes through here, grab her by the arm and firmly squeeze her arm and tell her no. The mother said, Pastor, I hear you. I said, I'm glad you do. And I wish you'd get a hold of your child and quit letting your child hit people in the church. But people allow their children to do that and negotiate with their children. No, the devil is a liar. And then wonder, well, my child's 16, 17, and rebellious. Why? They were rebellious at three and four and five, but you were calling it cute. You were having full conversations, negotiations. My favorite is when they count. I'm going to spank you, and then they start counting. The spanking should have come right after the announcement. But now we got a hostage situation of negotiation. I'll move on. Facebook might take my video down for saying all this stuff. <laughs> Let's look at one more scripture, Acts 19. You got to close the door. Listen, let me tell you, that child I had two intercessors with me. I said, we're going to pray a quick prayer and go. They said, Apostle, you didn't go in. I said, nope, because when the mother decided not to get rid of that stuff, I knew my work was done here. That child ended up going to prison later in life. I don't remember if they, I think they actually set off a small explosive in a store. But see, it started back then. It's amazing what a refusal to say no will cause in your family. Just that word no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Acts 19, 18. Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Watch this. And many that used curious arts, in case you want an interpretation, that's witchcraft. That's what curious arts is. Many of the curious arts brought their books together and burned them. 
And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Watch this in verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The word of God didn't grow until they burned the witchcraft books. So they got saved and said, bring everything you got and bur burn it. Don't even give it away because you don't want someone else getting out that bondage. Burn it. When you are seeking deliverance, you have to close the door. Had a young lady that came to a church I planned years ago, and she was a witch, and she was involved in alternative lifestyle. And so we began to pray for her and minister to her, um, but she kept going around the same group that she practiced all this stuff with. So she'd call me. I'd say, well, she'd call me crying. Where are you at? I'm at the nightclub. I'd get out of there. Then she'd call me. I'm with so-and-so. She'd be her, her, uh, her significant other was also a witch. So I'm with so-and-so. I said, Dad, you've got to get away from them. Then the witch, the other witch, started coming to church. And now we got two. I mean, but that's good because often you have witches that don't tell you witches. Now at least we know. Like, oh, we got two witches on the second row. Praise God. But she wouldn't close the door. And the devil took her joy, took her mind from her. She went crazy because she refused to say no. Deliverance demands no. Paul said, I long to see you to impart some spiritual gift. He was speaking of the power of connection. That he could connect to the church at Rome and a power from heaven flow over the entire group of people and shift the trajectory of their life. Do you know it matters where you go to church? I had a woman that was coming to the first church I planted. And we used to have once a month a healing and miracle service. And we had a woman that came with cancer in the latter stages and God healed her. But she went back to her non-spirit filled church that did not believe in healing and told her it was not of God. So after maybe a year, the cancer came back. And someone brought me the testimony, the cancer, the report, right? The cancer's back. And I began to pray. And I felt the Lord say to me, there's no point in praying for her. She's too far gone, and she doesn't have the faith to believe. The church she went to cost her her miracle. The power of connection. Some of you have got soul ties. You've got portals you've opened. You've got things you, you're doing. You know, there's a big controversy about cleansing houses. You don't cleanse houses with herbs and cleanse houses with... And I know that, I know that's something that's been practiced for many years, but lots of things have been practiced for many years. You, you cleanse houses with the blood of Jesus, with anointing oil, by praying over your house. I wrote an entire chapter in my book, uh, what is it, uh, prayer, well, what's my prayer book, oh Lord help me, what's my prayer book, I can't think of it, prayer assault, thank you, I was thinking of another title I wrote, prayer assault, a whole chapter on dedicate, the prayer of dedication, dedicate your car to God, dedicate your home to God, when Christians occupy buildings, we ought to dedicate buildings to God, we go in the hotel rooms, pray over our hotel room, and dedicate it to God. I don't care what went on before I got here. Now that I'm here, this is a habitation of the glory of God. This is a place of the presence of God. Amen. But you've got to close doors. I believe we ought to see revival where people come and throw their, their old books on the altar, throw their drugs on the altar, throw, throw condoms on the altar, throw all kinds, you know, delete phone numbers out of their phone and, and just say, I'm breaking, I'm breaking this. I'm shutting the door. I'm closing the door. I'm saying no to the devil. That's what happened in the book of Acts. And then the Bible said that that was when the word of God grew mightily. Not before, but that was when the word of God grew mightily. I believe tonight, for those that are online and those that are in this building, I believe God wants to break the power of enchantment off our life. 